This is Duke University. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Just be super conscious of Mr. Hill's time. Um, so thank you, everyone, for coming out. Uh, really excited about this event. Um, as you can see, this is a webinar style, so it's a little bit different than your normal Zoom. Um, folks, as you're coming in, you'll see a Q&A, a raise hand, and a poll section. Feel free to use the Q&A to submit questions throughout the event. Um, but to give a little quick introduction, my name is Kayla Jewett. I graduated class of 2020, um, two years ago now, um, and I currently work as a Catalyst Fellow in the Duke Career Center, spearheading this program, Duke Catalyst. Um, and this is a new program focused on just building self-confidence, self-awareness to help with decision-making through your entire Duke career, but then even beyond into your first job, focusing on those key mindset switches it takes to be a professional um, in comparison to being a student. And I also wanna give a big shout out and a big thank you to Jeff Fox, who is the donor to the program. Um, without the, him, a lot of this would not be happening. So definitely want to give him his props. But I want to start just with a quick introduction to Grant. Um, we're all pretty familiar with who Grant is, but Grant is an incubator who has moved with intentionality his entire career. He's an only child to only children, used to creating his value from within himself before it comes from others. A service-driven individual, he sits on the Duke Board of Trustees, the Board of Directors for NCAA, is co-owner of the Atlanta Hawks, and most recently is set to be the new managing director of the US men's national basketball team for the Olympics. Now an author for an upcoming autobiography, he is putting his journey to the page in his new book entitled Game, detailing a record-breaking career all the way from South Lakes High School to the Olympics, set to come out June 7th. Of course, we know him as Duke Basketball's number 33. Everyone welcome, Grant Hill. Hello, Kayla, thanks for having me. Of course, of course. <laughs> Um, so kind of give a setup to this event. The first 45 minutes is going to be purely interview with Grant. Uh, I have a long list of pre-prepared questions that I'm itching to ask him. Uh, but then that latter half, as I mentioned, is going to be a Q&A. So folks, feel free to submit, like I said, to that Q&A section. Um, and Nicole, who's our moderator, is going to do a great hand at assisting me and making sure I get to the questions as quickly as possible. Um, so be prepared for that. But to just jump right in, uh, Grant, I wanted to start off with congratulations on the book. I know that's a long, strenuous, tedious process um, in that new position. Um, I wanted to get into kind of the important part that goes into purpose and attitude, what this event is themed around, and talk about legacy. Um, so I mentioned in your introduction, you're an only child to only children. Um, how do you find that playing a role in your decision making? You know, with your father being an NFL star for 12 years, both of your parents being Ivy League, um, what kind of impact do you want to leave on the world? Wow, that's a great question. Um, <clears throat> you know, for, for, for me, um, you know, my parents obviously have, have played an incredible role in, in my life, um, you know, both during my formative years and even now, uh, you know, as a, as a middle-aged man and parent and businessman. Um, and, and one thing they, they always, you know, stressed upon to me was to, to, be, to be authentic and to you know, to follow your dreams and your passions. And, um, you know, you know, so for, for majority of my adult career, I was playing basketball and that consumed a considerable amount of time, you know, devoting to, uh, to getting to that point, to, to being able to play uh, in the NBA and then uh, to, to, to hang on as, you, as I aged and played till I was 40. Uh, so, you know, I retired less than 10 years ago from playing basketball. And, you know, that, that's, that can be a, you know, a scary proposition there as, you know, something you've done your entire life, something that has, you know, defined you in a lot of ways. And, and now you embark on, uh, on what's next. And, um, and so what I've tried to do is, is follow my passions and, and, and pursue opportunities, uh, pursue um, ventures that, that are real to me, that, that, I, that I enjoy, that, that I'm passionate about. Um, that, you know, that, that, that edify, that, that, that fulfill. And I think that's what we all strive. Look, I think Duke is an incredible school that's far greater than it was when I uh, graduated there almost 30 years ago. And so uh, you have uh, a student body of achievers and people who have uh, done well and, and, and are aspiring to do great things and, and aspire to be successful. And I think we all uh, defines success differently. 
Um, but we all aspire to be successful, whatever path we choose to go. Um, and so, you know, I think, you know, following your heart, being authentic, finding that purpose, uh, that was an exercise that I went through uh, at 40, you know, trying to find uh, uh, opportunities, roles, responsibilities uh, that align with who I am and, and what I'm about. And so it just so happens, I, I, I love the opportunity of, of being in leadership positions, uh, providing perspective, insight, um, you know, a lot of that's in the world of sports, uh, whether that might be uh, as an owner and, and vice chairman of the Atlanta Hawks, uh, serving on non-public boards like the NCAA board in an environment where intercollegiate athletics is, is quickly evolving. Uh, the NBA, the, excuse me, the National Basketball Retired Players Association, uh, you know, so being in these positions to provide leadership and perspective uh, as, as, you know, as, you know, as the world change changes, uh, is something that is something I've enjoyed and something that's consistent with what I want to do and what I want to leave when, you know, when, when my time is done. So, uh, I think following your dreams, your passions, being authentic to who you are, uh, I think, you know, is, is what's important. And I would impress upon all, all you know, all young, young women and men who, who are on here to do just that. Uh, and, you know, we all have an opportunity to, to, to create our own legacy, whatever that might be. Uh, and so uh, I, I envy and I'm excited for all of those who are on here who are young and have so much runway in front of them. Um, it's a great opportunity. Um, and I think a lot of the values and, and, and lessons and um, experiences that that college has afforded you and Duke has afforded you, I think will serve you well as you embark on that journey. Of course, of course. I, I really appreciate how you kind of broken it down and saying like playing basketball was almost its own lifetime and now you've started an entirely new one. Um, and something this event is also centered around is respect, openness, I think you talk about providing leadership serving your customers, serving your teammates um, in a role, as well as balancing your own self goals. Like you said, understanding your passions, understanding your motivations in the workplace and in the world. And sports is very specific um, in the idea that your customer is also your fan uh, and that has its own layered definition. Um, so how do you rank personal goals, team goals, and serving your customer in order of importance? Those three ideas, how would you rank those? Yeah, I think first and foremost, it's, um, you know, serving your customers. And, um, you know, I think, you know, whether it's with the Atlanta Hawks um, and, you know, having, uh, we just went through a, an arena remodel that was quite extensive. And while we went through that process, uh, a majority of what we thought about, a majority of our purpose was to serve our fans, to create an incredible in-game experience for our audience. And um, we even, we even um, you know, we even went into detail about, you know, Wi-Fi. And I learned a lot about Wi-Fi and bandwidth. And, uh, you know, a majority of our customers are young. We have uh, the largest millennial season ticket fan base. And, you know, I'm old enough to remember when you went to sporting events and there was no Wi-Fi. Uh, but for years, uh, something as simple as Wi-Fi, well, you would use that to maybe communicate text messages, check your emails, uh, maybe even check scores in a game uh, with, with a rival. Uh, but now we live in a world where uh, uh, the younger generation, uh, part of that experience is being able to upload your experience, capture photographs, videos, and to upload that uh, into your network, your social media network. And, uh, and so, I, you know, the bandwidth to upload is five times greater than it is to download. And, uh, and so, you know, even something as, 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 uh, as basic and simple as that, like that's important in terms of understanding your audience and then what depths are you willing to go uh, to provide for them and support them. Uh, you know, I serve on the board of Campbell's Soup and we're constantly, um, you know, collecting data and finding out uh, trends, what our customers, um, 
are looking for? What, what, what's new? Uh, how can we be innovative? How much money do we, uh, do, we, do, we, do we provide to support our innovation? Uh, so constantly having an eye on, on your customer at the end game in the roles that I serve in now are so important. I think then within that, it's about your teams. You know, what team, what executive team, what leadership team uh, are, are in place uh, to reach those goals, to reach the goals, um, to, you know, to support uh, and to provide and to supply your customers at the end game. Uh, and so how do we enhance our leadership? Do we have the right pieces, the right personalities? What kind of support can we provide? Can I provide? So our team uh, can, can, can maximize its potential and realize its goals. And then I think, you know, when you've done, you know, when you've, when you've you know, filled up those buckets, if you will, then your own personal goals uh, are, are fulfilled. And I think leadership is about serving. It's about serving others. Um, you know, it, whether that's on the basketball court and you're playing with five players on the team and you have, you know, 12 to 13 teammates, uh, how you serve them, how you empower them, how you instill confidence in them. Um, you know, basketball is, is, you know, you talk about it being a strong link, a strong link sport, but I think it's a weakest link sport. You're only as strong as your weakest link. So how can you elevate their performance, their engagement, their enthusiasm? Uh, these are lessons that, that I learned uh, on the basketball court. I learned in Cameron Indoor Stadium many, many years ago, many decades ago, but you know, those, those values apply in the roles that I serve now. And, um, you know, it's important customer team then self. I love that. I love that. And I love how you keep bringing up how it's not just providing for your customer, it's serving your customer. It's, it's offering your customer the unique things that they need to have the best experience. Um, and it leads perfectly into my next question because as I mentioned, you're service oriented, service first, but in a lot of unique ways. Um, so I wanna bring up something that I didn't even mention in your bio and I think a lot of people don't know about you is that you're, you're an art collector, specifically of black art. Um, and that's another way to serve the community is to gather art and, and inspire artists and uplift artists. So I wanna show you a couple pieces from your collection. And if you could just tell a story or a moment in your career that reminds you of this piece, that would be perfect. Does that sound good? Okay. Sounds great. I'm gonna share my screen and we'll go from there. So this is Stargazer um, from artist Colette um, from 1973. Yes, uh, Elizabeth Catlett. And um, she is a, uh, she was, excuse me, an incredible woman who's no longer with us. Uh, I had the good fortune of, of meeting her. Uh, she actually, uh, we commissioned her to, to make that, um, you know, to create that, that sculpture for us. And, um, you know, I, I, I think, you know, what I love about Elizabeth Catlett, um, obviously uh, just an incredible artist. Uh, she really, you know, I think first and foremost captures the beauty, uh, the strength, um, the endurance of, of women and black women in particular. And as it relates to, you know, the African-American community and the African-American experience, uh, you know, the, the black woman has been the backbone, the support um, uh, and, and the real strength um, and so she, you know, to, to be able to, you know, this to me reminds me of, uh, of the women and the sacrifices that they've made. I think of my, my mother who has just been absolutely incredible, uh, not just as a mother <laughs> and, and as a friend, but, um, you know, I think having served on the, on the board at Duke for 15 years, she served prior to that on the, um, on the, on the, on the, on the Duke, uh, business school, the Fuqua school of business board. Um, and has just absolutely opened her arms and loved Duke in more ways than I can imagine. Uh, I'll tell a little story about my mom. You know, when I was, when I was a freshman and uh, a number of my classmates were, you know, looking for inter, uh, you know, in intern, uh, intern positions in the summer, uh, I would, uh, you know, advise them to call my mother and just give them my mom's number. And a number of them were like, 
like, what is this? You know, like, and so they'd called my mom and, and, and she would do anything and everything to help young people, uh, you know, advance their careers, provide strategic direction, guidance. Um, I even had, you know, ex-girlfriends who unbeknownst to me, my mom was still being a resource and helping and guiding uh, as they've gone through uh, their lives. And so, um, so anyway, in a lot of ways, it just reminds me of the strength and the beauty uh, and the moment of reflection that uh, at times is necessary as we, you know, endure life's many challenges. And certainly this, this piece right here reminds me of that. Perfect. So I have another Elizabeth piece for you. Uh, this is Walking Blindly from the series of My People from 1992. Yeah, no, I mean, I think, first of all, that you just, I think it, the two pieces you've shown from Catlett just sort of demonstrate her, her talent, you know, in, in different, in different mediums. But, um, you know, I think once again, the glue, you know, the, the, you know, see a, a an older gentleman, it looks like he has a flask in his hand and um, maybe using that to, to ease the pain, medicate oneself. You have a child uh, or at least a young person who's sitting with their head down, um, you know, dejected. Uh, it looks as though, or maybe fatigued or tired. Uh, and then you have a woman on the left who uh, looks like they might be in church and uh, is giving praise. And and I just think it it, it speaks to the, you know, to, to, to maybe some of the, the trials and tribulations that have plagued uh, the, the community. But then in the middle, you have this woman who uh, is, you know, is, is, is the bright colors, the dress, uh, the look of joy, almost dancing in the midst of, of troubles. And uh, so to me, it's almost a reminder that we all go through, whether you're, you're, whether you're black or white or what have you, or whatever your ethnicity, your gender, we all have troubles. We all have uh, moments where uh, we are overwhelmed. And um, to be able to know that, that that feeling is temporary, to find joy even in those moments, because mo a lot of times those moments are, are opportunities for growth, uh, opportunities to evolve, uh, opportunities to grow and, 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 and learn. Uh, and so, um, you, know, you know, art, is a lot of things, it's a lot of its interpretation and how you see and view it. But uh, as I sort of look at this piece, uh, and, and it's interesting because those two pieces you've just shown are actually been in storage. <laughs> and so we have a, a, a rather uh, rather large collection. And, uh, and so I don't get the opportunity to live with, with all of my art at one time, but um, it's a reminder to, to keep dancing, to keep dreaming to keep, you know, to, 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 to stay appreciative and grateful and be joyful, even during the tough times, which we all experience at some, for, at some point in our lives. Yeah, I think that's, that's another way I did it as well. And I think it led me to choosing this next piece, um, the idea of holding back of, of how do you handle your woes? So what do you think of, or is there a moment that you think of when you immediately first see this piece? Yeah, so this piece was actually, um, you know, I, 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 I poached this from my parents. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's a piece called uh, Confrontation. And um, I grew up with this piece. This piece was in our family room. And, um, you know, a, as a young child, I, I, I thought it was like this, you know, three-headed monster. I, I didn't quite understand what I was looking at. Um, but, you know, you know, as I as I got older, I, I, I sort of see the symbolism here of, you know, sometimes the many voices um, that goes through one's head, and um, you know, obviously, little thinking before you speak or thinking before you you act. Um, you know, at times as an athlete, as someone who, um, you know, that that inner voice, and sometimes there's doubt that creeps in. I, I was, you know, a, a, a young man who lacked confidence. Um, uh, and so sometimes we all sort of deal with that internal struggle uh, and whatever that might be, it might be in school, it might be in sports, in your career, uh, dealing with family. Uh, and so this to me, in some ways, the way I see it and the way I um, identify with it is just that, that internal struggle that at times we, we are faced with um, and we have 
multiple feelings, multiple emotions. I think it's important uh, that we honor them, that we that we um, that we acknowledge them, uh, and then you know be a, be smart and really think through before we act upon them. And uh, and this piece is a constant reminder of that. Amazing. Yeah, I, I think the intentionality in this, in this piece, the thing you're speaking about. And, and I must say, I must say, I, I just, you know, I, I, my parents collected art. I never thought that I, you know, I didn't understand art, didn't really like it, uh, did not enjoy visiting galleries um, during my formative years. But I bought my first piece of art when I was a Duke student. And um, I, um, I, I went to the, well, you wouldn't. There was an old mall called South Square Mall that is, I guess it's now where the Super Target is, now on 15501. And there was a gallery in there, and it was an artist who was from Durham. Uh, his name was Ernie Barnes. And um, he, he's known for the art that was created on the 70s sitcom Good Times, uh, which I'm sure none of you are familiar with, but nevertheless, uh, he had a piece that he was commissioned by the, the, the mayor of Durham in 1986 to create a piece and it was called Duke Fast Break. And it had, uh, a, a, it, it captured a moment in Cameron and Johnny Dawkins, who was a, a Duke basketball legend scoring a layup against Carolina. And so that was the first piece that, uh, it was a print and uh, I paid like $25 for it. So you can certainly collect and support art on a budget. <laughs> I did that back, uh, back almost 30 years ago as a Duke junior. Wow, yes, art, art comes in all shapes and sizes. As you mentioned before, cat, like different mediums and everything, um, anything is possible with collecting art. Artists are always um, pushing their limits in a lot of ways, um, perfect. Well, next question here, I'll stop sharing my screen, even though it's a great piece to have as a background. Um, we can't get this, we can't get through this interview absolutely at all without talking about this upcoming memoir um, and what it means to you. Can you give us, you know, a little, a little piece about what we're getting in this autobiography that we wouldn't get in a biography coming from authors like Clayton Jeffrey or Bill Gutman, you know, describing you as a power forward, um, as an aggressive, you know, star, what are we getting in your behind the scenes? Yeah, you know, I mean, first of all, I, 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 Kayla, I'm not familiar with those gentlemen or those individuals, their, their biographies um, that they, I'm assuming, uh, you know, wrote about, about me. Um, you know, th this, this was an interesting exercise. And so, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll answer that two ways. First of all, I, <laughs> I think for me, I always, I always, you know, once I left school, I was always, you know, looking to achieve and I was always looking for. And, um, and so that, you know, as a basketball player early in my career, and I had tremendous success early on in the NBA, I was constantly looking ahead. So I never never displayed any of my accomplishments in my house, even to this day, uh, other than maybe the big shoes that you might see laying around my house. There's no evidence that I played in the NBA or you played basketball at Duke. And I think part of the thinking back when I was younger was I wanted to stay hungry. And I felt that if I, you know, displayed accomplishments or you know, looked back, if you will, then I would get, you know, in the basketball term, I'd get soft. And so I was constantly looking forward, constantly, what's next? What's the next goal? What's the next hurdle? And, and I, I had a career that was fraught with, with, with some highs and some lows as a result of injuries, but I kept moving forward, kept going. And when I, I guess I say all of that to say that, um, when I was inducted into the Naismith Basketball Hall of Fame in 2018, that then was a moment of reflection. And I think you naturally, when you achieve something like that and are celebrated, you're going to reflect. And I think ultimately what became the impetus for writing a book. And, you know, it was an interesting exercise to go back 
to different stages of my life and really kind of lean in on those moments and, um, you know, go back to my, my, my childhood, go back to uh, my Duke years, uh, my NBA successes, my injury. Um, you know, it, it was, it was fun. It was, um, um, you know, fulfilling in a way. It was also scary. Um, I, I think, I think it, it, at times you suppress things. And, and I think I learned that, you know, always looking forward wasn't always necessarily healthy because I didn't necessarily enjoy the moments. I didn't enjoy the successes. And, and what I learned through this exercise was that you have to take time to appreciate and be grateful and celebrate when you have those moments. Because as I went back, I, 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 I learned to appreciate them and celebrate them, you know, many years later and realized I didn't quite have fun <laughs> when I was in the midst of it because I was so driven on what was next. And, um, and so that was a, a real um, sort of learning opportunity for me. But, you know, I mean, look, I, I you know, I, I kind of shared it all. I was very vulnerable. Um, I think sometimes as an athlete, uh, well, definitely all the time as an athlete, you, you, you know, you're regardless of what fears or emotions that you overcome with on the court, you learn to mask them. And you learn to always present confidence and you always. And so I think that carries on with uh, off the court and, and your public persona. And so um, to be able to sort of, you know, peel back the armor a little bit and share, you know, some of my insecurities and, you know, vulnerability, being vulnerable, um, you know, growing up my, you know, um, some of the challenges that I dealt with. Um, not just as a child, but even, you know, the lacking of confidence in certain areas in a sport where I was one of the best in the world, you know, as, as, a, as an elite player in the NBA. And so to, to, to open that up, to open up and to share, um, you know, in, in some ways it was therapeutic. In some ways you're, you're frightened to death because you're, you're, you're exposing a, a side of you that you haven't publicly shared. But there was something liberating about putting it down on paper, going through the exercise, and then ultimately, you know, presenting it to the world. And so, um, you know, you, you don't, so anytime you do any, anytime I show up for something, or even this, this, this panel, or this, excuse me, this conversation, this chat we're having, you always fear that nobody will show up, and nobody will care. And, uh, and so I, I do have a little bit of that, where I hope this book, uh, at least, uh, at least I know my my family will buy it and support it. Um, but I, I think to be very introspective, to be very honest, um, and to share in, in these moments uh, is something that I did and I accomplished, and I'm you know I'm I'm, I'm proud of the uh, of the end end result. I love that. I, I was gonna say maybe your mom is gonna start recommending it to folks to to buy, tell your friends to buy and pick up. Um, since folks are still calling it. Um, but I think it, like you said, that vulnerability, it, it kind of leads into my next question of best ever versus best self. Um, so you said in a CNBC interview that you weren't sure you ever aimed to be the best ever. Instead, you were aiming to be a better version of yourself. Um, how does this best self attitude, the best self mentality differ in your head than atten attempting to be the best ever? Um, and, you know, how did it get you to these success moments, like you said, like being um, inducted into the Hall of Fame, other things along those lines? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, I, I, <laughs> I, I think with me, it was always about trying to, to become the best that I could be, uh, the best self, as you said. I, I did get to a point where I realized that if I could be the best version of myself, then there's a chance I could be the best ever. And that, that sounds like incredibly arrogant and uh, self-absorbed, but um, you know, my, my struggle and, and, and part of my growth and journey as an athlete was 
my self-belief didn't necessarily match my abilities. And my abilities might have, you know, might have exceeded that. And I, you know, once they caught up, <laughs> once I realized sort of, you know, who I am and, and what I could do, then it, it became, wow, if I reach my potential, I, I have a chance to be in that conversation. Now, obviously I got hurt and that never happened. But, you know, I, I do think striving to be the best version of yourself is what I believe we all should strive. Uh, the best ever is, <laughs> I mean, it's a, it's a lofty goal, and, and I'm not one to, to, to tell people what, what they should aspire to be, but, um, you know, in certain industries, that could be very subjective. You know, my wife, um, who is a singer, a recording artist, and has, um, you know, has been, around, I mean, singing for 25 years and, and Grammy nominated and such. You know, that industry entertainment is very subjective. And uh, the beautiful thing about sport, uh, sports is that it's, it's the closest thing to a meritocracy. If we, if we square up and we compete, you know, nine times out of 10, the, 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 you know, the, the better person, the better, the better athlete, the better, uh, you know, at that sport wins. And, uh, and so not all of life is necessarily like, in between the lines in Cameron Indoor Stadium. So I recognize that. So, you know, I just think working on oneself, striving to be the best version of yourself, um, I think is, is a recipe for success. It, 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 it's, uh, it's healthy, it's attainable, and I, and I believe it's something that we, we, we can continue to work on as long as we're breathing on this earth. And um, so, you know, Maybe that was a long answer to your, your short question, but that's sort of my thoughts on it. We all should, you know, and as I've pivoted and I've, you know, gone on and serving on boards and leadership positions, um, I, I'm not trying to be the best ever. I'm just trying to be the best, you know, best version of who I am. And, um, and, um, and, I, and I think that's, you know, and, and, and if that happens and when that happens and, you know, I can live with the results and in and, and, and most cases, the results are good. Exactly. As you said, sometimes your skills just outweigh your self-belief. You got to wait till it lines up and when it lines up, you kind of hit the golden zone. Um, awesome. So I wanted to finish up my series of questions before we move into the QA portion um, with a little, a little question for myself. So talking about this partnership you have with Fila, Know, getting into my sneakerhead, uh, talking about the looks and the colorways, but also about the opportunities that a partnership like that opens up. Um, you've also mentioned in an interview once that when you're passionate about something, that's when the gates opened up. And you've spoken a lot about that here today, but what goes into maintaining a partnership like that for so long? What kind of leveraging can you use um, with the partner? What kind of leveraging can you get into with a partnership like that? And what kind of gates does it open up for you? Um, I'm thinking most specifically the hillside park courts, the student to come Chandler park courts, things like that. Yes, you know, I, I think the beauty of, 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 you know, devoting my most of my life, 40 years of my life to participating in team sports is that you recognize the, 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 the importance of collaboration. And, um, you know, I started playing soccer, which really relies on collaboration. And you could be a great player, but if you know you're only as as strong as 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 your weakest link in, in, in soccer, and and in basketball, you know you can you can impact the game if even if you you know as the best player, but really you rely on on others, and, and that's what I learned at Duke playing for Coach K, uh, and that's how I've kind of approached my multiple careers on and off the court. Uh, so, you know, Fila, I mean, I, I, you know, I took a chance with them back when I graduated from Duke in 94 and we made history, you know, it was the lar it was the largest selling debut sneaker shoe or, or signature shoe uh, for, for an NBA athlete, maybe of any athlete. And, and I think that that record still holds to this day. Um, and we had a great run. Um, Fila became relevant uh, in uh, in basketball, but also in in culture. Mm -hmm. 
and, and then, you know, then I got hurt. There was some adversity and, um, and being hurt and not being able to play is not good when you're uh, paid a lot of money by a sneaker brand. Uh, and then ultimately we parted ways uh, for years and I went and wore uh, another, uh, another shoe. Uh, but recently in the last four or five years, we've reconnected. And I think part of it was just, it was the history, it was the, the shoes, but it was also just how we, there was a mutual respect, uh, a mutual, you know, having worked together, the experience wasn't bad uh, back in the day. And I just believe how you treat people, how you interact, how you manage success and failure. Uh, I think people remember, and that's a perfect example of, um, you know, now many years later, um, being able to, to, to reconnect, to, to relaunch shoes, to work on different colorways, to, I'm still amazed that people still buy the shoe, but you know, retro is in, so hey, you go with the flow. Mm -hmm. Um, but also to do, you know, substantive things, to be able to give back to communities that have supported me and supported Fila and the brand through the years. Uh, it's not just a endorser relationship, it's a partnership and it's a, it's a lifetime partnership. And, uh, and so, you know, between friends, you and I and the others who are on here, I mean, to be able to pick up the phone like I did just yesterday and call the president and chief marketing officer and discuss an idea of maybe finding a few black artists to create a shoe next year during black history. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so to be able to like brainstorm and share these ideas and approach things together as a group, um, that's something I enjoy and, uh, it's fulfilling, it's rewarding. Uh, and, uh, and so it's, it's something that's ongoing, but I think the cultivating of relationships, so much of this world and so much of success right. as we aspire to be successful is cultivating and nurturing relationships. And then when you have those partnerships and you work with people, um, what kind of integrity, what kind of character do you, I'm not saying I'm perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but I think when the good times and the bad times presented themselves, uh, I think how I responded, how I interacted, uh, helped me down the road when this opportunity re reappeared. Right, of course, of course. Well, thank you so much for all those <laughs> really great answers. None of them were too long, none of them were too short. Um, I would say you did perfect. <laughs> uh, oh, but is there any you. advice that you'd like to share, just kind of last things to wrap up before we move into the Q&A portion? Yeah, I mean, I, I said earlier, look, there, there are some incredible young women and young men who are on this, uh, on this, this virtual web webinar. And, you know, I, I just, I, I admire um, the students that, that make up the student body of Duke and their backgrounds, um, <clears throat> you know, what they have done just to arrive on Duke and, you know, to be accepted and be a part of the Duke community. Um, and, you know, as you matriculate on and, and, and you go out into the world and, and, and change the world, um, you know, to, to recognize that, you know, there are going to be challenges and there's going to be setbacks. And I'm a big believer that your experiences at Duke, uh, well, I can say my experiences. I, I don't know if everyone's experience was quite like mine. My experience wasn't, it wasn't always easy. You know, and and uh, and so, but I always tell people there's three qualities that, three characteristics um, that I took from my Duke experience, and they have served me well and have helped me navigate whatever life throws my way. Um, first of all, the ability to think, and you know, to be challenged and stretched and taken out of your comfort zone. Um, you know, everyone on here, everyone who's a part of this, this student body uh, understands that. And life is about thinking and about um, problem solving. That's another, you know, being able to solve problems. Uh, Lord knows as a student athlete, I had many. <laughs> and, uh, and the last is just the ability to endure. And, um, 
And so those three traits will serve you well, thinking, problem solving, and the ability to endure. Um, but understand challenges, speed bumps, hurdles, all of that will present itself uh, as you move on. And, and just to know that you have the fabric, you have it in your DNA uh, to navigate that is comforting, but it won't always be easy. And a lot of times those, those are opportunities for growth. Those are opportunities to learn. And uh, so embrace those moments. Uh, I always say they're, they're temporary. Of course, of course, it's always in the, Duke. Uh, I would say it's still pretty tough, maybe in different ways. I think Duke students find ways to pile up their plate until they can't eat anymore. So <laughs> um, I think that's the way we find it tough. Um, and that speaks to the first question of the Q&A. Um, someone asked, as an athlete who is planning to be drafted into the NBA and make a career playing in basketball, how did you prioritize and balance your athletic goals with your academic goals? Um, as a double major? Yeah, I mean, you know, um, 30 years ago was very different than today. And so when I arrived on campus uh, the fall of 1990 as a freshman, the last thing on my mind was the thought of the NBA. And, you know, it's a different time. Um, players, athletes today, particularly at Duke, there's an expectation that they'll make it to the NBA. That was not something that I thought about. My classmates, there were four, five of us total who came in as freshmen that year on the basketball team. Not one of us ever talked about making it to the NBA. Uh, so for me, I wanted to be successful. I wanted to win. Um, I wanted to you know, to compete in the classroom and, and do well uh, in the classroom. Um, but the thought of the MBA really didn't enter into the equation until really the end of my junior year. And that was when I thought, okay, this could really happen. And you have to understand there was no, there was, there wasn't, you know, technology, you didn't have, you know, the internet. Um, so you were, you were insulated from a lot of that. You were kind of in a bubble. And uh, not that we didn't watch the NBA, but it was almost one of those things where it was almost, it didn't feel like it was attainable in a lot of ways. Um, now, looking back at it, it was pretty obvious. And I look back at sort of what I was able to accomplish early on in my career. But, you know, I had so much fun at Duke. I had so much fun being a part of the Duke community that the, you know, the thought of the NBA, you know, that didn't enter, like I said, that didn't come into the, to the, to the, uh, come into the equation until later. So, you know, I do think though, juggling the responsibilities and requirements as an athlete with those of being a student and then having some semblance of a social life. Uh, my mother told me one time, she probably should not have told me this, but she told me, when I left for college, she said, it's not all about what you do in the classroom or on the basketball court, but it's about cultivating relationships with your classmates. And Duke is an institution, Duke is a school um, that uh, will have achievers, will have men and women who go on and do amazing things. And to be able to leverage those relationships is vitally important. So I took that to heart and I maybe, Maybe it was a little too on the social side uh, and not at, at times on the academic side. But, you know, I, I, I um, you know, I just did it. I don't somehow you found the hours in the day to, uh, to 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 get things done. And actually, surprisingly, I think I did better in school when um, when I was in season and when I had to to juggle and I had to 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 to, to manage my time um you know properly i tended to struggle when there wasn't a season and before the season and after the season that was when it was hard for me to stay focused but um it wasn't that difficult and and, and we didn't have the resources back then we didn't have you know tutors and study hall and, and things of that nature we we, we were kind of on our own when it came to that so 
uh, it required some level of responsibility and somehow, some way, I managed to get through. <laughs> Made it out. I think you speak to the idea of uh, kind of being thrown in the pool and, and taught to swim. Uh, sometimes you have to just kind of paddle until you reach the top. <laughs> yes. Um, amazing. But I think one other thing that you mentioned, relationships. And I think your mom was completely right in the idea that building relationships, especially with the alumni out of Duke, you know, you can be sitting next to the next Tim Cook is really important. So we have a question from a student who asked, who positively impacted your self-confidence the most, especially during your time at Duke? You know, um, but the, you know, I was just on campus on Monday and I interviewed Coach K for a feature, a feature that'll, that'll air at the, C, uh, at the Final Four uh, this upcoming year on CBS. And, you know, for me, you know, confidence was something, confidence and then also I think the desire to want to fit in. And sometimes you're not meant to fit in. And so during my four years, Coach K was constantly encouraging me, constantly pushing me uh, to, to stand out, you know, you know, to be great. And, um, you know, so I, I really think, you know, you know, basketball is an interesting sport. And, and, and sports in general, you put yourself out there in every game, every possession, you're putting yourself out there to win or lose, to be embarrassed or to succeed. And, um, you know, not a lot of um, jobs are like that. It's more deliberate, it's more sawing wood, you get results over time. But in sports, the results are immediate. And, and, um, and so I think being an athlete sort of helped, but I think coach, I had somebody push me and encourage me um to you know to be great i remember after my junior year and you know bobby hurley had had moved on to the nba christian Leitner had moved on a few years before and so coach was trying to get me to be more assertive and he said when you go home and and and, and you have dinner at your house with your parents don't take one dinner roll take three and uh you know he was he was encouraging me to be a little bit more selfish and a little bit more aggressive. And, um, but that year was a, was, a, was a real growth period for me. And I think I was raised to respect authority and process. Uh, and once I became a senior, it was about me and it was about my, it was my team. And I was able to put my stamp on that team. And that year really helped my growth as, a, as an athlete, but also as a leader and as, a, as an individual. And, the, you know, and having those responsibilities, you know, if I had left after my junior year, I don't, I don't know if I would have had that role and that responsibility. Um, and that served me well as an athlete, but also as a business, businessman but, and, and a leader as well. So Coach K was vitally important and instrumental in building up my confidence and belief during my four years at Duke. Amazing, amazing. Yeah, I think I like the I like the dinner roll idea. I like the, the little things that you can do to just find ways to build skills. Um, that's all we want to like transfer to students um, in these moments in these chats with different folks. Um, your session is on purpose and attitude. Our next session is on diligence and persistence. Um, so again, these ideas of, of the little things you do to, to get to the overarching idea. Um, Kayla, can I can I can I say one more thing? You mentioned. Oh, earlier, um, and, I, and I failed to jump in on, but you talked about the relationships mm -hmm. and cultivating those relationships and the Duke alumni. I, I really want to, I can't stress enough um, the importance of doing that. And there are Dukies, there are Duke alum, you know, all over the world who want to see you succeed and want to be a resource, want to be supportive. Uh, I, I think there was some, some marketing materials back when I was uh, a freshman and going through freshman orientation. And, and I'm probably paraphrasing this, but um, you know, they said it's a, you know, Duke is a not a relationship for four years, but a relationship for a lifetime. Mm -hmm. And 
you go to a school like a Duke University, yes, it's the experience, it's the education, which is incredible, mm -hmm. top notch. Um, but it's also to be able to leverage that as you, you know, as you move on. And so staying connected to Duke, staying connected to one another, to the university, to the alumni office. I just think one, it, it, it feels good to the soul. You know, every time I'm back on campus, I'm at Duke, it's like I'm back home. Mm -hmm. But it also can serve you well as, as you move on and you pursue whatever paths, whatever, whatever goals, whatever dreams, whatever careers uh, that are in front of you. There's a Dukey out there somewhere in the world who can be a resource. I know I've done that. I know many of my friends and classmates who weren't basketball players or student athletes, they've done that. And I just encourage you and everyone else that's on this to do the same. Of course, the alumni, the alumni directory is your best friend. Um, ask a Blue Devil, uh, that website to ask anonymous questions and get alumni response is super helpful to so many students. So there's dozens of ways to stay connected. And I mean, I'm doing that now, but even returning to work at Duke um, and to give back in a very formal way, but it's it's easy. <laughs> it's easy to do in an informal way. Um, as you mentioned, just to sit down, conversation, a coffee, anything um, can make a lasting impact in, in people's day, people's week, and, and in your lives. Um, so thank you again, Grant. Thank you so much. Um, we're gonna wrap up now just to give you a few minutes back to your day, but um, it was great to hear from you. And as I mentioned, there's more events to come. So folks, um, as you trickle out, stay tuned for more that Catalyst has to offer.